Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the SHE's webinar on school counseling, the roles and responsibilities during this pandemic. I would first like to extend a very warm welcome to all the participants. We have um, a great engagement and participation today. And from that itself, I can gather as to how important this topic is for everyone. A very warm welcome to all our panelists. Let me very briefly introduce you to them. Um, we have Ms. Simi Sharma. She is a very senior educationist and the founder director of Avalon Heights International School, which is a school in Navi Mumbai. Um, my rationale in inviting her has um, been because this is a school which I have been actively engaged in. And what I have seen is very proactive work in the field of mental health. So a very warm welcome, Simi, and thank you for joining us on this webinar today. And um, our second panelist is um, Upasna. Ms. Upasna Seraf is also a psychologist and a counselor. She has more than 25 years of experience in the field. And um, she holds an extremely important position in terms of uh, heading the HR department across the Bombay Cambridge Gurukul group of schools, which I think everyone in Mumbai and across the country are aware of. This is a school which, um, across the years, I know, pays a lot of attention to the mental health of students, as well as giving a lot of um, assistance to students with special education needs. So welcome, Upasna, and thank you for joining us. Um, our third um, panelist is Dr. Archana Bhatt. Dr. Archana is a professor and in psychology at Sarana College in Bangalore. And um, Archana and I have also been engaged uh, very closely in providing some um, online courses in education to her students of psychology. So very warm welcome to all three of our panelists. Um, I would request um, all our panelists to please, um, you know, um, unmute themselves as well as put them put yourselves on video so that everyone can see you all. Yes, and um, wonderful to have you all with us. I'm seeing you all after a long time. So great to have you. And uh, so let me start off without much ado. Uh, there's just a little bit that I would have to say for online um, hygiene for everyone who is on this uh, platform. Um, I would request all other participants, apart from the panelists, mm -hmm. On you, um, ensure that you constantly keep track of that because otherwise it can be disturbing. Um, also, um, if you don't need to be on video, me, you may not be, but that's completely up to you because I'm sure the panelists will also enjoy just seeing that there are people on the platform. Yeah, so that's completely up to you. And um, lastly, I know that you know because. All of us may not be as facile on, you know, the technology. We just might go into presentation mode, and I'm going to try and ignore that. But just be careful that you know you try not to do that. Okay. So, um, without much ado, um, let me um, let me begin and um, send me my first question to you. Yes. yes and uh, that's another that's another thing I would like uh, all the participants to do. And that is that give us about ten minutes because there's seven questions that I would want to start off this uh, discussion with. And then please feel free to start putting in your questions on the chat. I will try and take in um, you know, as many as possible. I may not be able to take in all, but I will try and take in those which will be very useful to you know, all those present here. Uh, to the panelists, I have one request. 
um, if our responses can be um, one uh, kind of three, and two, uh, if we can give the participants on this platform uh, things to take home, because most of our participants are all school counselors, and they're really looking forward to what we can, you know, share with them so that they can bring back in reality. So, if you can do that. Um, I just want to ask um, Simi Upasana and Dr. Archana, is my, is my, am I audible or is there an uh, issue? Absolutely audible. Absolutely. Audible. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. So people who are having a bit of a problem with my uh, audibility, um, can you just look into your own devices, please, so that I can start off. So thank you. And my first question, like I said, Simi, I'm going to direct to you. Sure. Okay. What, according to you, should be the focus of school counseling or a school counselor right now during this period of the lockdown and the pandemic? Right. Thank you so much, Smita. And first of all, let me thank you for uh, you know inviting me. Uh, it's it's uh, really a pleasure and uh, you know privilege to be here uh, to talk to everyone. And uh, you know we all have been. Uh, you know, now we're becoming sort of used to the pandemic. You know, we've been in this situation for quite a while now. And, uh, you know, the, the emotions are changing over a period of time, you know, what, what it started out as to, to where it's going now. And I think uh, one of the very important things is uh, for the counselor to really make sure that you uh, make the school community aware that you're still available, you know, that you're still present and, you know, that you're accessible. And I think there the school also has a very big role to play because normally uh, if a school doesn't value the counselor, then, you know, they tend to, that's the first thing they cut down when they cut the budgets, you know. Uh, so I think it's, it's uh, really, really important that, uh, uh, you know, I think we, we need the counselor in school uh, more importantly at this point than ever before, you know. So making sure that the school community knows you are there and you are available. Uh, whether it is through the Zoom platform or whatever platform schools are using or phone calls or whatever. And the other thing is to, uh, you know, you have to be working uh, with, with all three communities, the parents, students, as well as the teachers. So this is really a time where you need to um, identify signs of stress. Uh, you know, of course, uh, go back to the cases who were already the at-risk cases, uh, you know, so keep... Um, keep in touch because this could be really stressful for people who were already uh, struggling, maybe had home conditions that were dysfunctional and, and uh, so on. Uh, also, you know, teaching proactively some kind of an emotional regulation to children, uh, talking to them about what the pandemic, uh, you know, really uh, is about. Because if, if children buy into every piece of news that is floating, uh, you know, on social media and other platforms, it gets very stressful. And there are families and children uh, where COVID is really hitting them close, you know? So very, very essential that there is a, you know, need to educate children about what this is. And somewhere, you know, we are also seeing a little bit of a stigma coming with COVID. So people get embarrassed, try to hide uh, if there's someone in the family or, uh, you know, close by. So I think this there's, there's definitely needs to be a, a dialogue opened up and an education for the teachers, for the parents, and for the children on how to address questions re related to pandemic, you know? Thank you. Thank you so much, Simi. Thank you. Um, Upasana, I'm just going to um, kind of um, extend that to you also, that any other thoughts on this, apart from what Simi might have uh, put in? Uh, sure. I think Simi has covered a great deal uh, uh, at the macro level. And uh, all of it is very relevant, especially uh, about being able to talk to kids about what is happening, how they're feeling about it, what they can do about it. Uh, I'm also going to point out that uh, with the pandemic, uh, children have been facing a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. Uh, some of them have experienced depression. And uh, it's going to be the role of the school counselor to address these issues for students. Um, for those students who have a strong social support, a family support, uh, you may have to redefine your goals with the kids. So it may be that uh, earlier the kids were referred to you for, say, misbehavior in the classroom, uh, which may not really happen anymore. Uh, but what you will be helping them with is things like uh, planning their studies, planning their routines, uh, self-motivation, uh, safe online behaviors, because they're going to be online uh, pretty much a lot of the times. 
helping them understand current events. Also, I think we need to help students uh, to, um, you know, to uh, help students with clarifying the misconceptions, breaking down the myths that they might have, and how they can refocus their energy to constructive pursuits. So a little bit of um, demotivation, irritation is something that we're seeing in children. And sometimes it is uh, mild. But uh, for a discerning counselor, these can be issues that can be addressed either at a one-to-one -one level uh, with the child, or it can be in a classroom situation. Right. So, Upasana, I'll just take forward, in fact, a little bit from the thread that Simi was talking about, you know, that how um, school counselors need to make themselves know, I mean, let people know that they are available, right? I right. think she's really okay. the nail on the head, you know. So, Absolutely. what might be your thoughts? Because, you know, you're working across a group of schools. What might be your thought on how counselors can communicate, okay? How can they communicate to the stakeholders, such as the parents and the teachers, that we are available for the children? Right. I think uh, one of the things that uh, I think a lot of schools did start uh, was a helpline, uh, especially during the month of May when the lockdown was at its peak. Uh, and uh, we were feeling the effects of it uh, more strongly. So uh, helpline was the first thing that went across, which made people aware that, OK, there is some sort of help. For you know, if you're feeling stressed out, if you're feeling anxious, uh, if you're feeling worried about stuff, and uh, that was the first step. Uh, the second, I think, is about being able to reach out to parents and to teachers. And I think we should not forget that parents and teachers themselves are people, and they are likely to go through the same things uh, that you are like to go through. You know, so it's important for us to be able to reach out to them to let them know one, what are the signs of stress, for example. You know, uh, how do you know that you need help? You know, and if you can if you can communicate those signs, you know, to them, then they know that there is this field which will help you cope with issues that most people consider to be a personal problem. You know, uh, there are family issues, and unfortunately, because of the lockdown, a lot of families are kind of stuck with each other in uh, whatever situation they were in. You know, so I think the council is getting uh, becoming very proactive in terms of either sending out circulars, putting it up on their websites, um, having the heads of schools. Uh, talk to parents and to teachers about the value of reaching out to the counselor and what are the areas in which they can help. I think that can that can build up advocacy and uh, visibility uh, for the counselor and their role for the schools. Right. Thank you. I, I was also, you know, thinking about uh, maybe you know the uh, within the school, the schools can also have um, counselors probably make out you know small videos which they can kind of send out. You know, even team videos. You know, like say someone like you and maybe your group of counselors, or like Silly and you know her counselor and her school principal. Like you know, have a little video where information can be given out. Because what I've always with the pandemic, although we may think that people have information, um, they often uh, you know there is so much of information overload that people are not able to filter out what's right and what's not. And I think right. it's important. Help them do so. So I, I was just wondering that you know maybe schools can also work on something like this because if these kind of videos are sent out maybe on once a week basis, then it can be very um, you know it can indicate a lot of support to the entire family. So right. you know I just want to that. Um, Archana, my next question to you. Um, you know you have been engaged in technology, and I'm sure that you know you. Um, you know, you are also keeping track in terms of what's happening in schools, etc. So, what, according to you, might be some of the, you know, couple of the most important um, mental health challenges that schools might see when we are going into a normalized face-to-face -face mode? Uh, yes. Good evening. So this is quite an interesting question. Actually, this is something that I have been wondering because I need to train my students because uh, they have not been, neither have the teachers been trained for this, nor have the parents been trained for this. None of us were ready for this. No beard education teachers to deal with the pandemic and the sort of uh, uncertainty that we have right now. Neither are the teachers certain, nor are the counselors certain the children are lost, the parents are equally lost. So this is something that uh, none of us have been prepared to and none of our uh, education uh, training has prepared us. Um, 
right now, most of what the school uh, counselors have been dealing with is with interpersonal relationship, the behavior of the children in the school. But right now, none of this is going to make sense to us right now. It is more to do with how are the kids going to deal with the dynamics at home? Because now the home has changed. It is no longer a house. It is an office. It is a workspace. It is a school. It is a learning center. It is everything. And in spite of all this, then we have the multiple generations living in the same house and the dynamics are completely different. We all know the challenges that the parents have been having working from home because working from home is almost never ending. At least when they go to an office, they have a timing, they come back home and that's time for the students, the children. But now that's not happening. And then we have on one side the overload of technology and we have to understand that with the learning that is happening, there could be other things included with the technology uh, part of it. And then we also have the other children, especially with the younger ones. Now, it is not only the content delivery which is important, the social skills which go with education. How do I deal with kids of my age? How do I deal with elders? How do I deal with others? Now, that is what the children are missing out right now. And when they come back, it's like, OK, all of us like vacations. Two months, three months, fine for the family, for the kids, fine. But now it's become too much. Now we don't know, especially for the younger kids, where they are not going through the regular online classes. What do we do with them? How do we keep them engaged? What is that content which is keeping them engaged? And tomorrow after, uh, you know, let's just hope that the pandemic ends uh, and the children can safely go back. But whenever they enter, will this gap, will this gap affect their learning? It's not just the content learning, it's also the social learning. Will the gap, and especially again when we have teenagers, peer, peer learning is extremely important. When they do not have the peer learning, what is it that they are losing out? How do they deal with people? Because it is their marks are just one part. The marks are just important for them to get into good colleges. But beyond that, what sort of uh, you know uh, uh, training that they get, uh, the first-hand training that they get, labs, none of the labs are functioning. So all these things and uh, the uncertainty, especially for kids who will be in this board examination phase. Uh, many children have this uncertainty, what am I going to do now? The one thing that children have to remember, I'm not alone. So whatever, if I am suffering, if you want to call this really suffering, I'm not alone. So I don't have to worry. There are thousands and thousands of kids with me. So I think this whole gap, and I see this more of a social learning gap that is going to take place in the pandemic, this is going to be very crucial in us getting the children back when we get them back to school. How are the teachers going to connect with them? How are the children going to connect with each other? These are the things I think that we need to look into. Right, right. Thank you very much, Archana. I think you've focused on a lot of important things. And in fact, I'm going to take it over from there to Simi. Um, you know, Archana spoke about this um, lack of social socialization basically right right and uh, we all know that you know one i think more than the academics um really it is the socialization the social skills and the social skills learning um that become that is such a big part of the schooling right so yeah. Sini, again my question here would be this that you know having had arjuna speak about these things what are a couple of mental health challenges that you and your team might be preparing itself for when you would begin a face-to-face -face or normalize. Just a couple of them which you see as the priority that you know everyone in your opinion should be prepared for. Um, I think you know one of the things like I spoke about is uh, is this whole health anxiety you know the paranoia okay. about you know what if we get it and so this whole anxiety the the health anxiety is one thing that we will have to deal with once you know children return back to school uh, for sure secondly you know a lot of kids are responding very differently to the online platform uh, to our surprise some of the kids who were not so responsive and interested in normal classrooms are suddenly very very participative and responsive and and it's the you know other way around with some others so once right. they come back, you know, uh, not just the learning gap in terms of what they learn, but how they are going to learn and how would they choose to learn, uh, you know, is, is another challenge that we're going to be facing, which is not a mental health challenge, but it's a challenge, you know. 
um, and in terms of uh, uh, you know mental health like i said the anxiety for for health and also the 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 um, uh, the anxiety for uh, their parents' health. We find that a lot of children are very worried about what will happen to my parents. You know, so a lot of kids that we talk to these days are, you know, extremely worried about that part. And some of them are going to, you know, a couple of them have lost their uh, family members. You know, which is a, a very difficult uh, situation that, you know, a, a kind of grief that they need to deal with. So um, I think uh, that's more or less what uh, you know i mean there are many other things but uh, yeah, right 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 so if i may summarize a little bit from what um, you know both arjuna and sanid said i think one is about the fact that children are not um, you know going to be socializing during this period and thus when they come back are we going to look at some deficits in social skills especially for children who already are probably facing some behavior issues anxiety issues etc the second thing also is that we're looking at very uncertain times and a, and a high rate of health anxiety. Health anxiety also largely because the adults themselves have so much anxiety that it's getting projected onto the children, right? Um, so children are going to come in and we are also going to have children coming in who have lost family members, okay? So there is going to be grief, there's going to be bereavement. Um, you know, we don't know how they've you know, handled it, so we're going to get children with that. And uh, then, of course, we're also going to get, you know, a bit of a learning slide, so to say, that will happen during this period because uh, we do not have, um, you know, the same infrastructure, the same environment that we were used to, and the new environment is not what anyone was totally prepared for, right? So, um, Upasna, my next question would be, um, you know, would be to you, and that is that during this online period of schooling, and we don't know how long that's going to continue, right? So, Upasna, what might be some of the red flags, okay, that counselors should look out for for students? Either, either these might be anxiety-related mm -hmm. issues, or they might be something's happening in the home because everyone's in the house. So, right now, even if I'm, you know, reading and hearing, I'm also concerned about things like domestic violence, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, happening. How can a school counselor look out for that? when we're looking through the online world. Okay, what might be some of the red flags that get thrown up to them? Um, I think uh, this is kind of important because I think school counselors um, uh, will need to, uh, I think, educate uh, both teachers and parents about what they're looking out for because I think the maximum it interaction of the child is going to be uh, with the teacher and parent. Earlier for us in schools, uh, teachers were a great indicator for identifying stress in children. You know, because we could see that acting out behavior in the classroom itself. Uh, but now I think the focus will have to shift to parents because parents are in a much more viable position to identify, uh, you know, changes in behavior uh, that might happen with children if their uh, eating and sleeping habits have changed or have been impacted adversely. In case they see low participation from children, low motivation, low energy, if they are seeing rebelliousness, irritation, aggression, uh, in the children. At the other hand, they may see things like isolation, withdrawal uh, in children. And uh, I think parents have also been talking about things like uh, children talking about hopelessness, about despair, about, you know, nothing, wh what's going to happen, you know, that kind of anxiety. So I think when we are, we are coaching parents into taking a look at uh, looking after these signs and getting in touch with a school counselor, that's one of the things we can do. With teachers, certainly we are looking at uh, some key signs that teachers can look for. One is uh, attendance. So if students are not, not coming online in class, you know, then I think it might be useful to reach out to these kids um, and, and figure out what's happening to them, you know, and probably help the parent out with that. Um, if the student is low energy in the classroom, if the teacher is seeing the student is slumped or he is uh, uh, not attentive in the sense he's not, uh, he's not engaged in what the teacher is doing or that he's continually, uh, uh, you know, distracted, you know, that he's constantly doing something else on this so in fact we've had a case where the parent has given their cell phone to the student about uh, uh, you know to study to join an online class but the child is really not in the online class he is uh, uh, probably on some social media platform you know doing his own thing so if keeping in touch with the parents uh, back at home uh, can be very essential for schools and for teachers uh, the other thing is of course self-referrals 
So if, if school counselors can get into the classrooms and talk to kids about uh, what are the signs of stress, what is it that they're experiencing, and when is it time to seek help, you know, then that might help students to either refer themselves or be able to at least guide their friends towards uh, seeking help when need be. And of course, classroom observations are another means by which counselors can identify stress in children, you know, because you will definitely see acting out behavior at either of the two extremes extremely aggressive children or completely withdrawn children. So um, I think these are some of the indicators we should be looking for. Right, right. Thank you so much. So um, sure. if I get you right, I think you, what you said is that one of the most important um, important ways, you know, to get our indicators um, is through interaction with parents and with teachers. And that's going to also include a little bit of parent coaching. Am I right? So that Absolutely. they can get Absolutely. across to in fact, right now and, we are um, more dependent on parents than we were earlier. You know, yes, because world. it's like school is in the backyard. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Right. So yes, I. So thank you so much for that. And I think, um, like you said, you know, so one is your parent education, your teacher interaction, and um, you know, um, like you said, you know, your self referrals. So you know, um, get some things done with the children themselves, so that they can, um, you know, they can come to us with it. Um, and like you said, you know, excellent what you said about the absence, you know, we keep track of the attendance and if the teacher finds that the child has not been there for quite some time, then that's definitely something that, you know, needs to be taken up. Right. So, um, so that's, uh, you know, thank you for, for that. Uh, and, so um, I'm sorry. Can I just add one more point? Yeah. Uh, for us in uh, BCD, we look for three things, key things in our students. It is attendance, yeah. achievement and appearance. So at least with the achievement also, if the teachers see any drastic shift in the child's um, uh, academic performance, then I think it may be right. a cause for concern and worth referring. That's all I need to add. Great, great. So I think that's a, that's a great takeaway, your three A's, you know, your attendance, your achievement and appearance. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so from here, I'm going to move to um, Simi. Simi, should we be telling the children, don't be worried? Um, Simi, I think you're on mute, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. So um, I don't think we should be telling children don't be worried because uh, it's very natural to be worried and it's normal to be worried and everyone is worried, you know, right. um, including the parents and teachers and everyone is worried and it's okay to worry, right? Uh, but not to be swallowed by the worry. And I think uh, that's where the need to, you know, educate them on, uh, regulating emotions, uh, like like somebody said, uh, we are all in it together. You know, we're not alone in this. So uh, I think that's more important, and uh, that's where you know uh, we have purposely introduced life skill classes along with the you know other classes because and, and I've told the parents very categorically that if they miss a math class, it's okay, but if they miss a life skill class, it's not okay. You know, and you. Uh, I think uh, Sushant Singh Rajput being the latest uh, classic example, I tell them that you can you can be in the College of Engineering and you can be a bright mind, but if you've not put the inner world in order, you know, it's of no use. So you've got to make it a priority and make sure that kids are coached and educated on what's happening to me, being self-aware and, you know, being able to uh, manage themselves, what's called self-management you know, in these times. And at home, you know, there are situations, you know, all the time parents breathing down their neck, you, you have situations where you have hovering parents and or you have parents like on the other side who neglect you completely, you know, leave, leave, leave you to your own devices. So, um, you know, sometimes the children may not get their space to be, you know, uh, so it's very important to also be able to coach parents as well as students on conflict resolution, which is definitely going to arise you know, at all points and, uh, you know, and, and not to turn the house into a battleground over a worksheet or like you also come across 10th grade parents, you know, for whom like 10th grade is happening in their heads, you know. So uh, and, and for, for us to like really make them understand that, hello, you know, we don't know what the 10th grade and what the report card and what the system is going to look like at the end of the year. So just relax, you know, and allow children to be, I mean, you know, this whole uh, programming with which we've been raised is something so, uh, you know, difficult to deal with. So so you need to take a lot of, I mean, we've had to take a lot of uh, counseling for 10th grade parents who say, you know, world is not coming crashing on their head. So just take it easy. 
for now their happiness is more important peace at home is more important than anything else so again the teachers also have to be told to be flexible to not really get into a top gear and you know get into a high expectation mode they have to have reasonable expectations and be flexible at this point of time and you know allow children to uh, take their because like like we all are cleaning and cooking as well these days you know we have uh, additional uh, household jobs that none of us were doing you know few months back so i think um, all of this requires a new sort of rationalization in every stakeholders mind yeah. right right thank you thank you so much so um upasna same question to you should we tell children not to worry yes it comes from sunny very clearly not to worry but then how do we help them to not worry um it's tough um let me just state that and it's a uh, tough because adults have yet not figured it out you know it's like whether it is teachers parents counselors themselves people who are on the group you know if you had to take a look at like how much does this pandemic worry you and how are you dealing with that worry you know and if we have some sort of clarity as to what is helping us cope with it the accepting of the uncertainty uh, can be very important you know and then then we go talking to kids about it i think sunny that's really right um i think it's 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 it's, it's important to tell kids it's okay to to experience anxiety you know that you are going to feel worried about it but what i'm what i'm really looking at right now for counselors to do is to help kids plan one day at a time you know don't try and look into your future two years down the line five years down the line even next year for that matter and that is something that i'm trying to tell parents and teachers as well you know let's deal with the present moment and just take a look at planning for maybe tomorrow or by the end of this week you know but because everything is so unpredictable we really can't count on having any foresight uh in terms of where the situation will lead or what what will be required or what will be the plans of government authorities with regards to exams or you know um, results or anything like that so uh i think the best way to deal with it right now is to just take it slow take it easy and and be supportive i think being supportive right. is going to be one of the most important things to help children uh get along and that will happen with adults as well over each other as well you know so we have to we have to create this whole community you know of people who are going to be um uh, able to uh, uh pro- facilitate you know uh, the 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 needs of children and the fears and anxieties of children and to accept that these will happen just telling a child don't worry is not going to change anything you know it only means that he's going to uh, stop telling you that he's worried you know or if you tell a child like what is there to worry you know look at all of us we are all in this you know so that that those are not answers those are not that, that those are not responses that help children feel better you know but uh, tell children it's okay everybody is in some certain situation let's take one step at a time one day at a time you tell me what you're going to do today and what's your plan for so, tomorrow you know that's about so, it so when i'm listening when i'm listening to the two of you what comes to mind is probably um if i were a school counselor what i would do is you know um definitely focus on providing the children a little bit of structure so you know how they can plan maybe a week at a time so okay. that they have some idea um of what their pathway is going to be and when they at least plan in one week at a time and one day at a time i think what we are also looking at in a way is a practice of mindfulness so i think that mindfulness for themselves as well as for the parents and i think this is something that the teachers can also engage the classroom in you know so it's not that we are in an unstructured free flowing kind of a thing and we do you know that probably creates more uncertainty right now but i think a little bit of structure and the practice of mindfulness and again something which can be communicated when one is probably talking to parents and teachers and perhaps even you know maybe form small parent groups or something which you know a little time can be kept for that you know so like you were talking parent education parent communication because parents are now i think very very concrete and valid partners with yeah. us on a day to day basis <laughs> so i think they're going to really um, contribute a lot uh, uh, you know at, at this point if i may add yes, uh, smita uh, uh, you know in our school uh, i i have uh, opened a meditation program for parents you know twice a week mm-hmm. and for for the whole school school community in terms of students also uh, you know they sign up and and sit and come for my meditation and mindfulness with me and that's It's, actually mm-hmm. you're very right the most powerful thing uh you know to really calm them down because it's easy right now we need that actually, 
it's easier to intellectually understand that i must not worry okay uh, but to really get to the state of you know being able to breathe and relax is something that one has to really facilitate so that really right. does work yeah right so you know i um, i spoke about i think there was a question here yeah that um, you know i spoke about um, there being certain videos right and that we can use that probably as um you know as a means of communication um upasna if we were to use these kind of videos say which is directed to the older kids okay like your adolescents or your 8 to 10th graders what might be some of the content you know just maybe a couple of points that you can uh, for you know kind of give away that should be there in this content which could really help everyone okay so often uh, what i think that the content of the video should miss actually be is about uh, one is the reflecting of the situation as is right now you know okay. uh, with the with the with the expression of the feelings you know the anxiety the stress and the actions that people get into due to that and if the videos can represent a um, healthy ways of coping you know so like even an earlier i think uh, uh, archana mentioned conflict resolution you know we need to take a look at okay how do you resolve conflicts so the videos can have some of these situations and indicate what are healthy ways maybe even unhealthy ways you know so then you right. learning what to do and what not to do as well you know and and what how you can how you can control you know things from escalating you know so i think the teenagers i think it's also about communication you know uh, how are you going to keep in touch with your friends you know how are you going to ensure your best friend is still your best friend how do you you know how do you know that the girl that you like is not you know on facebook with another guy and things like that you know so kids have these concerns which are very real to them you know and i think some of these videos could reflect how they can maintain relationships how they can manage emotions how they can manage their studies and how they can develop coping mechanisms to handle anxiety right right thank you so much um archana what are your thoughts on this you know because you work a lot with the young adult population right and um, your young adult population in terms of you know your 17 and 18 year olds onwards are all under lockdown so i'm sure you're also very concerned um about you know what's happening to them so actually my question to you archana is that now that your young adults are at home what is it about their being at home that is of concern to you right now um i have multiple concerns not uh, just not with the young adults that i deal with but uh, even otherwise when i see my son at school i have a teenage son myself so the problem i see is there are a number of uh, you know population which we are not able to reach to one where we have these rti uh, students who come from the rti quota where probably these children are not connected online and the parents are not able to help them now i have students who have gone back to their native places where they do not have connectivity so i have yes. that one lot with them then i have especially when it comes to these adolescents i have these advanced learners they irritated with the pace at which we go at class you know the speed that we uh, do uh, the classes in and then we have the slow learners who we do not see them because we don't know what's happening are they able to cope up with what i am teaching so these are the three main areas that i see that they have a problem with and then the other problem with the young adolescents especially when it comes to their career planning right from 10th grade onwards till i go even to my postgraduate students the same problem what next i have been having because even in a college we run a open counseling center and we've had a lot of people walking in 10th graders 12th graders what next ma'am do i take science do i take arts do i take commerce is this going to be there even after 5 day 5 years mm-hmm. right so these are the concerns and then the usually they look up to their parents for answers and the parents are totally lost the parents are in no way in a capacity to answer the questions because many of them are even going through financial losses uh these young adults have a problem the uh, i have with this adolescence is when they put on the video they do not want us to see the background 
because they do not you know the house probably they come from if they put on a different uh, persona altogether when they come to college when they come to school but at home it's a different story so the only way we can connect to them is when they come on screen when we see them when it's a live session and this is a huge huge issue for them and then these are the things which are eating them from inside the concern about the future my career choices and uh you know uh, not being able to reach out in terms of network connectivity and then my life is lying bare in front of the people who are seeing me that means my other classmates are also seeing me my house when people walk behind me how are they dressed how do people talk i might be able to speak in english properly impeccable english but at home someone might be uh, screaming and yelling and talking in a language which probably others would not consider uh, uh you know decent enough or dignified cool. enough mm. right mm. so these are the issues that uh, personal issues are one thing that they don't meet their girlfriends their boyfriends they don't meet their uh, peer group where they share uh, but other than that these are the issues especially uh, the status issues i feel are coming out more in open now with my adolescent and uh, young adults right right thank you very much archana i think you've given us a different perspective you know the slightly older group yeah and which is why also you know that was one reason to um you know invite you on the panel that you would give us a different age group right um simi but my same question to you like you know um, the kids are at home parents are at home and and there, there's a lot that's just happening within that so um you know i would want you to probably just give me one overwhelming concern and also one overwhelming positive thing that we are seeing um uh, because of the situation of everyone getting together uh asini i think again you're on mute i think you're on mute i'm so yes. sorry yes yeah so i think uh, one of the interesting things that's happening is that uh, you know families are bonding you know yes. uh, because there is uh, no other choice so people are beginning to look at each other you know and uh, making space for each other and that's a positive development um however the challenge you know that's becoming the biggest challenge is the screen fatigue yes you know? that's it. that's what a lot of uh, a lot of um, comments on the chat are that you know if you can also address that yes yeah so i think uh, you know uh, that's where uh, wisdom needs to be exercised because you know uh, now government has given a recommendation but even before the recommendation came you know we had decided that there should be not more than two classes a day because uh, yeah. you know you you can have uh, you know seven to 10 periods in a day in school uh, which is very very different from the kind of uh, you know tiredness and fatigue you have when you do two online classes so we right. restricted to two online classes and on some days of the week it goes to three that's the max and then intersperse it with uh, like i said fair dose of recreational activities life skill classes fitness classes uh, you know which are happening online uh, so that um, you know there is some kind of a, a movement and uh, like i said a, a little home room time where kids can have they, they actually were asking for it and we just started it uh, you know that they were missing just just talking to each other you know so every time they come online it's it's just about like okay listening to the teacher you know and with the headphones in your you know ears you just have no choice but to listen to the teacher so there's less distraction in that sense but um but they were missing you know just uh, interacting socializing with one another and they were finding some um, you know uh, under the carpet ways of doing that uh, you know uh, chatting on uh, uh, you know the the status not chatting on the chat but chatting on the status they found some interesting ways of doing that so i think we've allowed them to you know come about half an hour or 20 minutes before class and just get together be with each other right. and, and talk uh, you know so um right. so yeah that's that's where i think um, yes there is screen fatigue but uh, but at the same time there is no choice screen is screen is the only savior at this moment you know right uh, right screen right. is what is keeping us um, you know connected, connected. And, and, yeah. Yeah. yeah so thank you um i would just like to add in that you know uh, from what i've been hearing reading talking to different people um as school counselor i would i would be concerned about homes where there is the probability of domestic violence 
I might want to keep my eyes and ears open, you know, for the possibility of child sexual abuse, because these are the things, if they have been present before to even a smaller extent, is probably going to get exacerbated during this period when everyone is together. So um, like uh, Upasana said, I think one really important thing is to maybe um, form small parent groups, um, try and get in touch with parents individually, uh, keep your eyes and ears open is I think really important in spotting what's happening because as a, as a counselor, as a mental health person, I would want to keep that you know uh, flag up for myself at all times. Uh, Upasna, my next question is for you, and I'm going to kind of spread it across all three of you at one time. And that is that we're seeing, um, you know, obviously in this time, we're seeing a lot of financial crisis, right? And um, the way things are going, it's probably going to grow a bit before we kind of, you know, are able to plateau and deal with it, right? Now, parents are really struggling with this, and because of the financial crisis, it's going to create a lot of anxiety in the homes. Right? Can we, would we as school counselors be able to address this with parents? And if you think that yes, we can, then how? Um, the financial crisis that parents are facing and its impact on how they view schooling uh, has been a controversial topic, I think, in the last whole month. Uh, been in papers everywhere, been on the agendas of all major stakeholders. And uh, I think where school counselors are concerned, I don't see that they have a role with um, this agenda with parents, because I feel they really need to be, uh, you know, stay within the boundaries of that role, because the minute they step into an issue that's like fees and finance, you know, uh, they are going to lose their credibility as people who are working on emotional health. You know, so uh, my my take on this basically is that counselors need to only see that if they have an opportunity to guide school authorities, you know, to minimize the impact on children, you know, for 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 financial issues that are pertaining to the school, you know, where parents are concerned, obviously the counselors can't really do anything to change that situation, you know, but if they can guide parents how they can protect the children from feeling the same level of anxiety. Right or being impacted by the financial concerns at home, then I think that could be useful. So what you're saying is that the counselors need to very clearly understand the divide, that we're not here to really address the issue of the fees, etc., because that's not in my control. But what is in my control is to help parents kind of um, protect their children from this and to not project their anxiety onto the children, right? Am I right? Is that that is what you were saying? Um, Simi, your thoughts, because you're heading to school, and I'm sure you get a lot of this coming from the parents. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think my, uh, so, I think my uh, request to you would be, what role can the school counselor play in reaching out to parents in this situation? Uh, right. I think, uh, you know, uh, as a counselor, because the school administration and parent fee fight is a different fight altogether. It's got nothing to do with, uh, you know, anything here. But where right. there are, and, and let me tell you, uh, th this fee commotion is anyway not created by people who are actually suffering. Okay. It's created by another breed of people. Now, the people who are actually suffering, uh, you know, uh, they come across in a different way. And uh, I think what is really needed, and you know, I'm sorry if this uh, it doesn't fit this performance, but I think the spiritual counseling does help them a lot, and and that is what helps with, like I said, our meditation group, and you know, invite parents, and not just parents. Actually, some of the teachers have also gone through the same thing, where they, you know, their husbands or families have lost the business, and yes. uh, you know, they, they've had to move to smaller homes, uh, they've had to make uh, you know real changes in their lifestyle because of uh, you know what's right. happening. So I think in right. such times, uh, you know, a, a reinstallation of the belief that this too shall pass and, you know, there is an impermanence to all of these experiences and it's, it's okay to have faith, you know, is something um, that the school counselor can instill. So that that, that amount of, uh, you know, empathy, uh, understanding and guidance, uh, you know, does go a long way in making people feel better. And if a parent can sort his own emotions and his own pain and his own frustrations, obviously it is, you know, likely to affect 
the children much lesser. So I think it needs to be both ways. If the parent is suffering from something, and if, even if they're open to it, if they're uh, open to discussing, again, most parents and all parents are not open to uh, even sharing what they're going through. But when you hear that there are families who are open, then I think the counselor can definitely step forward and offer uh, you know, ways to cope with the situation and, and make way forward. Right, right. So I, um, as, yeah, and Simi, I'm just going to continue with you because I think there's a there's a question here which I think is uh, you know um, kind of continuing from where you 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 mentioned that you make sure that children attend life skills guidance classes. So what some one of the questions is that you know what are some of the skills? Okay, so if you can give us just maybe two skills that you think are most important for uh, you know to be covered under these life skills guidance classes right now in the current Same situation. Okay. See, um, I think, uh, you know, we basically focus the life skill classes on self-awareness, self-regulation, social awareness, social regulation, you know, those four quadrants of emotional intelligence. Uh, and then basic questions about life. So children are actually uh, free to offer the kind of topics they want. So, for example, you know, dating, marriage, love, destiny. Uh, these, are, these are very much, you know, topics that they want to talk about. And I think... Uh, right. You know, so we give them the opportunity to talk about whatever. And I think friendships at this age is a very, very big thing. You know, uh, how important it is to, to get peer acceptance and to fit in and to be a part of this clique and stuff. And I think that really uh, preoccupies a lot of um, their mind. Uh, so life skill classes actually need to answer what is uppermost in the students' minds. So we have a structure, but I always tell people that please follow the angel and not the agenda. So when we go, if children, so we, we for example, you know, last week we started discussing Sushant Singh Rajput suicide because that was very interesting to them. And we landed up with depression. And this weekend, like tomorrow, I have a debate on depression, you know, whether depression is a choice or an illness. And they're preparing very hard for it, uh, you know. Uh, so, so they are reading more about, you know, what this is and, you know, what are the signs and symptoms and how to deal with it. And tomorrow they're going to debate about the topic. So, so I think the topics will emerge from, you know, what is it that they really are struggling with and, uh, you know, that they want to discuss. I think one has to be really open to catch it from them, even, if, even though you might have a certain basic uh, scaffolding or a structure with you. All right. Thank you. I think that's, that's really helpful. Um, uh, Upasana, there is one question which I think, you know, because of the, 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 the expanse of students that you might be, you know, seeing and, you know, your counselors might be dealing with. I think well, a couple of questions that uh, importantly come up here is that um, how can children deal with or, you know, manage the presence of quote unquote difficult family members, yeah, during this lockdown? So, you know, if they're not getting along with certain people, but they're now 24 hours with them, what might be one or two ways in which they can handle them? Yeah. Oh, very tough question. Um, a very impossible situation, frankly, uh, because um, I, I know this is happening. Uh, there are there are extended families, their grandparents, there's a generational uh, gap. And uh, especially with teenagers, they find it very, very difficult to deal with constant instruction and, you know, nagging and pointing out uh, behaviors and habits. And uh, children are reacting. Yes, they are reacting. They are, they are getting rebellious. They're breaking rules. Uh, they're flouting instructions. Um, as a counselor, I know that one of the things that we learned early on in our uh, training is that we can't really change things. Uh, we can't change situations for children, much as we would like to. Uh, and uh, helping children to cope with an environment that is uh, faulty or that is impaired. For example, if there's domestic violence, there's conflict in the family, there is abuse. Um, you don't get you don't tell children to get okay with that, right? It's, it's not okay, right? So you are helping children deal with emotions that are coming out of it and trying to make sense out of it. Now, at the very least, I know we have to. Uh, see if we can get a fa the best best we can get is a family approach where we are able to find one like in the whole family if there are five people if you can identify the um the the strong person the strong support 
for the child. Right. You know, and work with that person to try and see how they can resolve conflicts between people. So uh, it can be in terms of either decision making, where uh, there's an assigning of tasks, there's a schedule for things, which is mutually decided upon, you know, and that can help a lot. Uh, secondly, I think every adult in the house has to be a little more patient with children than usual, you know, because they are going through a tough time. Their life has been disrupted very significantly, you know, and uh, a little patience is going to go a long way for that. In addition to that, children don't have any outlets for playing. They can't go down and play with their friends. They can't engage in football and cricket and all the activities they love. So the entire energy level of children is 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 stuck, you know, which is going to come out in behaviors which may seem annoying to adults or you know may seem difficult for adults. But I think uh, for children, I, I would advise all counselors to try and work with family members, try and work with families uh, where possible. And where it is not possible, see, for example, grandparents, you know, uh, with grandparents a little harder because they are old, you know, and they're a little bit, st they're set in their ways, you know, so how we can get children to work with the path of least resistance, you know, to work, to work in a way that there is a sort of a, a mid, mid, mid path that they can take. So negotiation basically is going to be your crucial skill that you will be helping children learn and use to navigate difficult people at home. Um, and difficult, I'm still restricting myself to people who are not into abusive, uh, violent right. behavior. With abusive, right. violent behavior, I think counselors have a big role in protecting the children. We have to figure out how we can protect the child in that situation. Right. So um, I think what, um, you know, what I can immediately start thinking about when you've been talking is that um, I feel we really need to set up parent support groups you know, which will then also allow the school counselors to provide some kind of parent mentoring, parent education, because, you know, if we're, if you're going to depend so much on parents and parents themselves are getting into conflict with the children, then I think they're going to need some support. It's just my thought on it, um, you know, Pasna, from what you're, um, what you're coming up with. Um, correct, me if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong on that. I think with parent support groups, I feel it's a it's a slightly uphill task in our culture, you know, <laughs> because we are more more used to talking about uh, the positives than the negatives, you know. So parents right. are really not very forthcoming, and I have often found in school situations that parents are more likely to point out the child as a problem than themselves, you know. So the child is basically a symbol of the issue in a family, you know. But everybody, every adult in the family is content to let the child be the representative and let the child be the recipient of the intervention, you know, without having right. to uh, ex uh, go through any change themselves, you know? So I think if counselors succeed in setting up parent support group, that's great. It would be super. Okay. Yeah, right. but, if we, uh, but um, I, I, I hope it works actually. Right, so what you feel is that what might actually in reality, realistically work is reaching out to individual families and the individual children because at least they'd be willing to share, right? Okay, um, my last question actually, and that goes to Archana, that you know, with all of this happening, do you foresee some changes that are going to come about in your textbook teaching, so in your curriculum, okay, that you're going to put across to your new students of psychology as an impact of the, um, you know, of the, pan of the pandemic? Oh, well, that's something that has to come about. And uh, I'm already re repenting that this didn't happen before the pandemic, because at least all the counselors we have out there are now learning. And I would have uh, wished if my students already had learned. The first uh, thing is, how do we deal with children whom we don't see physically, especially if they are special children? What if they have some learning disabilities? What if the teachers are not able to uh, find out, uh, pinpoint if there is a learning disability? What happens to this child? Now, how would a counselor intervene when there is no direct interaction with the child? And uh, the nature of the problems, whenever we talk about school counseling, as I mentioned before, we talk about uh, classroom interaction, conduct disorders, the problems with hyperactivity, the child disturbing the class, all these things. But the focus now is going to shift completely. And yes, it is probably going to be more family oriented even after the children come back. Because 
coming back to the new normal is definitely not going to be the old normal so the uh, family is going to uh, play a very very important role for the next one year and how do these uh, children adjust with the parents and the family dynamics how is the family going to support now we have to study about this because now the focus is going to be less on classroom and more on the family which is a support system for the children and uh, how do we identify now uh, when upasna was talking about the red flags i usually see uh, when i see my son even in class and even when i see my students there are some students who linger even after the uh, teacher has left the class why is it that you know as as a normal child the child should be more this thing that okay i have a 10 minute break let me run get some water meet my family talk to someone come back now why is it that this child is lingering back here why is this child not leaving the meeting at all even when the next you know waits in the meeting till the next teacher comes there right so these are the things now these are the new red flags that we have to look into because these were not the things that we ever thought of and uh, when we uh, probably we will have to now look into the teachers dashboard what time has the child posted the homework is the child posting the homework very late in the night because when the child writes the homework we never think about it as to what time did the child write the homework but now if the child is posting it very late in the night why is it very late in the night and then as a counselor if i can teach my uh, students now what are the activities probably you can do in a uh, life skill class which are going to be more projective because expression is going to be very difficult to catch on an online platform or probably even if we uh, go back to the normal that sort of expression is not going to be there so we have to focus on projective techniques what can i give to my students that will make help me uh, sort of uh, Uh, see what are the problems that they have you know can i give them creative writing can i give them painting what are these things and again we had drug abuse we had uh, uh, substance abuse probably the focus is now going to change a bit again from there because availability of drugs itself is a problem now so what are the new abuses that the children have got into what are the new uh, habits that the children have got into so these are the things yes i don't know when the textbooks will change but as a teacher yes my approach surely has to change and um, probably all the counselors have to become students again to see what is it that the children are going through and the paradigm shift has to take place now very well said very well said thank you so much archana and uh, we you. have uh, you know we've come to the end of our session so i would just um, invite all the panelists starting with simi um you know just to give your one takeaway message to this entire group of counselors who's been with us and who's been with us for this one hour just your one last takeaway for them like a closing statement um semi you're on mute <laughs> puts me on mute <laughs> <laughs> okay okay so i think um, i would say that as counselors uh, this is the time to reach out uh you know and uh, you know break the barriers uh, that exist and and reach out to uh, families and children and 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 work closely with the parents teachers because teachers also need a lot of um, guidance and education so reach out to teachers and reach out to uh, children of course right um archana what's your last take home message for everyone our old methods are probably not going to work we have to experiment we have to uh, uh, sort of see what are the things which are going to work for us as counselors it will take time probably will not hit success right away uh, another one two months we have to learn and we have to reach out in new ways which we have not thought of and uh, how many ever i have been seeing the questions uh, can you give us concrete ideas concrete ideas only come when we deal with the students directly and it's going to be tailor made completely now because each one is sitting in a different family different house not sitting in a common classroom so we have to have tailor made ideas now and we have to be creative about it um upasna over to you for the last uh, you know message um <clears throat> i think i just like to talk to counselors about uh, the way they are going to be working now uh there's going to be a sea change i mean you are you are you are going to be providing online services and uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, uh, restrictions will be there. For example, you can't, you may, you may not be able to guarantee confidentiality or privacy. Uh, you may have uh, difficulty with testing and diagnosis. Uh, your intervention methods now have to adjust themselves to an online situation, which means that your intervention strategies have to be creative, interactive, and uh, they have to still have this uh, uh, same effectiveness. And most importantly, you have to redefine your goals because uh, the reasons for which the kids were referred to you, I imagine that you're taking on kids who were also referred to you last year. And uh, for those who are referred to you now uh, from last year, you may have to redefine what is the goal that you're working on with your intervention because things have changed and there are new things on the children's mind. So it's important that we don't go by uh, the old plan you know, and look at a complete revamp, not only of uh, uh, what is it the child needs right now, but also our skills and our knowledge for how we can help them. And of Thanks. course, I would so, like please be particularly, particularly uh, aware of those children who live in abusive homes, uh, where there might be physical abuse, domestic violence, sexual abuse. You have to uh, take immediate steps to protect those children. They have absolutely no choice and they have no recourse. So thank you so much. Right. So thank you. Thank you so much, all the panelists. And in fact, I would like to say here that, um, you know, um, on the 18th, 19th and 20th, I'm personally conducting a series of workshops for counseling skills for the counselors during the pandemic. And this is a three workshop series and you can get more information from us. Uh, in fact, this Saturday also we are conducting a two hour workshop. I mean, everything's online, of course, on resilience. So how can we build resilience for children as well as their families? And, um, you know, so we, we conduct a workshop every Saturday and every Saturday it's related somewhat to the webinar that we're doing. Uh, I personally am also conducting this weekend a couple of workshops on crisis intervention and trauma management because crisis intervention is the way in which we are going to prepare ourselves for when children come in. And I think I'd like to end answering one relevant question which came in here and which has been a little troublesome and that is that you know our schools are schools are asking school counselors to go on leave or not you know they're not required and i think that is that is not a good thing that is happening and i think the way school counselors must make themselves uh, visible is to you know put themselves forward and provide help to whoever is available in school so that the school recognizes the importance of mental health which unfortunately, culturally and as a community, we're not yet, you know, giving as much importance to. Um, so all I can say for everyone present here is that we plan to do a lot of these um, kind of webinars and because there's a lot of counseling uh, based issues that are, are coming up and we will be having, you know, many such um, great panelists with us. So, um, you know, keep tuning in because we have what, you know, so we, this is our Wednesday webinars. And we have it every day, every time from five to six. So thank you, Simi, Archana, Upasna for being here with us. And thank you to all the participants uh, for being here with us. And participants look forward to your feedback also. So as always, we can improve ourselves. Thank you again. Thank you, thank thank you, so, you so much. much. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.